Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome the 12th president of Morehouse College, Dr. David Thomas. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. And good afternoon. On behalf of Morehouse College and the Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome you to the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center for this historic occasion. Today, we will observe an important milestone. Philanthropist, Oprah Winfrey, an American icon, author, and media mogul, has returned to Morehouse College to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Oprah Winfrey Scholars Program. I'd like to take this time to recognize some of the special guests that are with us today. The Morehouse Board of Trustees, Ambassador Andrew Young, President Emeritus of Morehouse College, Robert Franklin, the Honorable Mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, the Honorable Mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, Morehouse alum, Randall Woodfin. <laughs> Presidents and representatives of the Atlanta University Consortium leadership are here. Civil rights activist Joseph Lowry, Councilman. <laughs> Councilperson Cleta Winslow. Dr. Paul Judge, class of 99, and many former and present Oprah Winfrey scholars. Today's events, which have included a luncheon, the unveiling of an oil portrait to Ms. Winfrey, and this community conversation celebrates Ms. Winfrey's commitment to the scholars of Morehouse College. 30 years ago, Ms. Winfrey donated a generous gift that would finance the creation of a bold academic initiative at Morehouse College, the Oprah Winfrey Scholars Program. The program has since funded the education of nearly 600 men, scholars, giving them opportunities for global experiences that would open their classrooms to the four corners of the world. An impressive list of Morehouse men has benefited from Ms. Winfrey's $12 million investment in the Oprah Winfrey Endowed Scholarship. Among them are Mayor Randall Woodfin, a member of the class of 2003, who was elected in 2017 as the youngest mayor of Birmingham at age 36. Another former Oprah Winfrey Scholar, Tupé Falarin, a 2004 alumnus, graduated from Morehouse College with a perfect 4.0 <clears throat> grade point average and became Morehouse's third Rhodes Scholar. He is now an award-winning writer. We have an audience filled with impressive Winfrey Scholars today who are inspired by the mission of Morehouse College to educate men with disciplined minds to lead lives of leadership and service. And they are inspired by the gift that Ms. Winfrey has given them. It is my expectation that they will take what they learned in classes at Morehouse and during their studies abroad with the South Africa Leadership Program and do great things that impact their communities, the nation, and the world. So what does the Oprah Scholars Program mean for the men of Morehouse? The Oprah Winfrey Scholars Program, as I mentioned earlier, has financed the education of almost 600 students with strong academic potential, allowing them to complete their undergraduate degrees and benefit from exceptional leadership experiences. Almost 300 students have expanded their worldview through trips to South Africa, funded by the scholarships. Graduates of the Oprah Winfrey Scholars Program have the opportunity to go on as our 2019 graduates have done to teach for America, like Sean Bryant, Clifton G. Davis, and Carlos B. Otten, to go to doctoral programs, 
such as Justin Samples, who this, this fall entered the Columbia Doctoral Program in Physics, are on to prestigious law schools, like Ellis W. Walton, who entered Howard's Law School this fall. In short, the Open Winfrey Scholars Program means that students needing some support to achieve their dreams will have received and still will continue to get that support and more and that their lives will be forever transformed. I'd like to thank Dr. Jan Adams for her leadership of the Oprah Winfrey Scholars Program and for the work of the faculty and advisory board, of work of the faculty and advisory board who have helped to make it a success. And so, without further ado, I want to bring to the stage our guest of honor, Miss Oprah Winfrey, also known as Dr. Winfrey at Morehouse College. Ms. Winfrey. Thank you for, uh, for being with us today. Uh, just um, a few um, uh, directions re related to the format here. Um, this is going to be a traditional fireside chat. I love those. Um, and um, we know that uh, we've got to stop around 4 o'clock, stay on target. Well, we're already a little late, so we don't have to. We, so we don't have to stop. No, okay. We stop when you're ready. You heard it here. Stop when you're ready. You okay. heard it here. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to begin. You all already missed class today, right? <laughs> I apologize for that. Yeah. Should I, I give you a note for tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin with some questions, okay. and then um, we're going to leave time to open it up to, uh, to our scholars uh, to ask you questions. I love this. So do you all do this a lot, like fireside chatting? No. No. <laughs> You're special. Because I, I think this is really a great idea, and, and I, I love the idea. Hi, Dr. Lowry. How are you? Oh, there's my boyfriend over there. <laughs> Joseph Lowry just had his 98th birthday yesterday. Woo. 98. Civil rights icon leader. And my boyfriend on the side when Stedman's not available. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So... Um, as I said in my uh, introduction, and we acknowledged uh, at lunch today, it's 30 years ago. Yeah, that, which I said to you, I didn't, real, I, I didn't realize that it had been that long. I really didn't. Yeah. Today. Yeah. 30 years ago, the give has had significant impact here. But what, what, where I'd like to start is to ask you the question, why Morehouse? Why did you choose Morehouse? Uh, for that gift mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the power of it that came because your name was associated. And, and what, did you, what did you want to have happen? Well, I will tell you that at the time, as I shared with the, my sons earlier today, uh, that I hadn't really had a lot of interaction with men. And the Oprah show was focused ba mainly on women who were, who were stay at home moms at the time you know, looking after their children. That's why so many people grew up watching the Oprah show, coming home, watching with their moms. And um, so that was my audience. And I always lean into what I really knew. Uh, I felt in my first experience here at Morehouse the same feelings that I have today. I was so moved, so impressed by what Dr. Adams articulated earlier in today's luncheon. Uh, by the incubation, incubation of leadership. 
and I didn't have the language to express that at the time, as Dr. Adams so eloquently did today, but that is what I felt, that this was a place where the moral core that was the center of what I grew up with, that had given me my value system and my work ethic and my belief in something greater than myself and my understanding that I was carried by the ancestors and carried by the legacy of people who had dreams for me and prayers for me that would never be able to fulfill or imagine the life that I had. I felt that the very first time I came here. And so the money was an offering to support that in these men. And also because I understood then as I understood now that African American men are so, are an endangered species, are so um, misunderstood and have been so marginalized that wherever we can, I can uh, lend support to, to, to try to change that image. And that is what, that is what Morehouse is doing. It is saying, this is who we really are. And any man who comes through here and takes what this institution has to offer seriously leaves a better man. Leaves a better man and a better human being, better able and certainly willing to know that a life given in, in service is a life that will actually bring you the success of your dreams. Because there, there, there is no true success without service. Great, thank you. That is what happened. Y'all still doing it. Yeah. Still impressive. I'm, I was impressed that everybody found a suit. <laughs> All the scholars today had on suits. You know, you can't go to a funeral and people are wearing suits anymore. People just come in dressed any old kind of way. And so the fact that you all cleaned up, not just cleaned up in your mind and came prepared and had wonderful things to say, but I see you. I see. I see what it took, took to get the suit today and to get the tie and the bow tie and to put yourselves together. I'm telling you that matters. Great. Matters. So I was, I was um, saying when we were over in the uh, leadership center and we were doing the, uh, the video yes. that um, the mission of Morehouse College is to educate men with disciplined mind to lead lives of leadership and service and uh, made the observation that your life has been about leadership and service. Yeah. And I'm just um, curious how you think about yourself as a leader mm. and how you connect that to being a servant because you've had an impact on so many. Yeah. Well, thank you. The truth is, you know, now servant leadership is a way of looking at the world and a, and a, and a way of approaching uh, your, a particular value system. But I just was raised to be a good, decent person. And I remember when um, people first started saying that I was a brand, I was offended by it because I was like, I'm not a brand, I'm a person. And I resent being called a brand because I wasn't working to be a brand. Now everybody wants their brand. Everybody on the Instagram wants to be a brand. But you know, what a brand really is, is, is the consistency of whatever you're representing as your truth. And so probably around the, 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 the national show started in 1986 and was around 1989 when I was interviewing the Ku Klux Klan actually and, and I say this to share with you that there is a lesson in everything. And there is nothing in your life that's ever happening that's out of order for you. So everything that's showing up is showing up not just to, not just, uh, to you. Things aren't happening to you. They're also happening for you. So if you know that and you approach your your, your life from the point of view of what is this here to show me and what is this here to teach me and what am I supposed to learn from that and why did that happen and not why did that happen in an accusatory way, but why did that happen? What is this here to teach me? That is actually my favorite question. I continue to ask it and ask it more often when I'm in trouble than not because I know if I've gotten myself into a situation 
and it's an uncomfortable situation that I am supposed to learn from it. There is nothing happening to you ever that cannot also be used for you, for your gain. And so understanding that um, early on is what brought me to, under, to, to know that when I was interviewing the Ku Klux Klan and I saw them in the audience signaling each other, uh, I thought, whoa, what's going on here? And I said to my producers afterward, I'll never do a show like this again. And then in the next week, there was a show that we had done with a, a, a man and his wife and his mistress. Now why he was crazy enough to come on with his mistress, I don't know. But the producers were thrilled that they had gotten the man to appear with his wife and his mistress. And in the middle of that live show, the man told his wife that his mistress was pregnant on live TV. And I was embarrassed. I was humiliated for her and for myself that I had allowed that to happen on my watch. And I said, this mistake will never happen to me again. So I'm not gonna do that kind of show. And I'm not gonna do the Klan. And later, I spoke to some of those, the members of the Klan at the, when I was ending my show. And what I felt in that show with the Klan giving signals, I thought, I'm doing nobody no good. I thought I was exposing their vitriol, their hatred. I thought I was showing that to the nation. I thought I was using them, they were using me. They were using the platform in order to recruit. So the tape that I did with them, they went out and showed to everybody, and they got people to join the Klan because we're on the Oprah show. So figuring out how to allow myself to be the big question of my life has been to God, use me. God, how will you use me? So when I ask how can I be used, what shows up is an answer that maybe I had not planned on. But if I, as I was saying to, to the scholars earlier today, that if you lean into the flow of your life, there is not a question you can ask in sincerity of the life force that we call God that will not also be answered. Nope. I'm a, uh, an organizational theorist. And yes. I study organizations and innovation and leadership. And um, my observation about you and your show, your, your, your different activities, right. is that um, you have been both transformative yeah. and innovative. And I can remember watching one day the Oprah Winfrey show, and you talked about you're going to do a different kind of show. Right. Right. You're going to leave that behind. Yeah. And some people That was like, after this happened. Yeah. Yeah, that was after and, the Klan and after this. You know, um, I'm sure there were people who thought, well, there can't be another Oprah, right? right? Because this is the Oprah we right. want her to be. Um, and likewise, you've, you've innovated and transformed your network. H how do you think about innovation, change, transformation, and how do you empower the people around you to do it? Because you're Oprah, but you couldn't have done all this by yourself. Of course, you, the, the most important thing that all of you are gonna find when you leave here is who do you surround yourself with? How do you build your team? And as I was sharing with some folks earlier, you, the more successful you become, the more people you have around you who are willing just to please you. So you have to have a core team of people. You have to have your core buddies, your core, I call it my kitchen cabinet, people that are going to always tell you the truth. And all of my innovation has come from the question of how can I be used. First of all, let me just say this. I do not think there is any real life without a spiritual life. There is no real life without a spiritual life. And by spiritual, I mean religion, if that's what you want or need. But I mean, understanding that there is a force greater than yourself, whatever you choose to call it, whether you call it creator or the divine or call it Allah or call it universal energy, there is a force 
greater than yourself that created you, however you believe you got to be here. And true freedom comes when you align your mind with the divine. True freedom comes when you use the energy of your personality to serve the calling of your soul. And so you can line those two things up. So all of my innovation and all of my progress has come from being in alignment with what I really came to do. And so what I came to do started with me the same way it start, has started with you. So when I was a little girl, I grew up speaking in the church. And at the time that I was growing up in, you know, apartheid Mississippi, we, we, we had what we call like, we, we used to call them Easter pieces because we would have like a little piece of the book, not the whole book, you have like a whole little piece. And so my first broadcast experience came from standing on a stage speaking in church. I was validated by that because all the sisters, the mothers sitting in the front row would say to my grandmother, Hattie Maid, you got yourself a talking child. <laughs> this here is a talking child. So the thing that gave me a sense of value and meaning, where I felt loved, where I felt seen, where I first felt heard, was speaking. And so that speaking thing carried me from church to church to church. By the time I was eight years old, I was reciting all of God's trombones, beginning with, Invicti with, beginning with Invictus, which wasn't a part of God's trombones. But you know, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there be for my unconquerable soul. I'm saying that at eight years old. I don't know what an unconquerable soul is, but it sure sounds good to me. And then, beginning with James, James Weldon Johnson, and God stepped out on space and looked around and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world, ending with the judgment day. So I was doing all of those speeches. So that carried me into a broadcasting career, which was divinely designed. So the story was, I'd gone to, uh, I was in something called a Miss Fire Prevention Contest and I was the first black woman ever to be in it because prior to the year I was in it in 1971, you had to have red hair. And I say hair because I was in Nashville. <laughs> and you had to have red hair and nobody black had ever been in it. And one of the questions on the stage was, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to be when you grow up? Up until that moment, I thought I was going to be a teacher. And all of the, uh, the best answers were taken. Three other girls said they wanted to be a teacher. So I had to, on the spot, come up with something else. And the thing that came into my mind, now I know by divine design, was a picture I'd, I'd seen in my head earlier that morning of a woman called Barbara Walters. You all ever heard of her? Barbara Walters was on the Today Show. So I'm, I, I, I don't know where the answer came from, because I was going to say fourth grade teacher. Instead, I said, I want to be a journalist, and I want to be able to use the telling of stories to allow people to see themselves in a way that shows them the best of their self. I don't know where that answer came from at 16, but when I went back to pick up my prize at the local black television and radio station, uh, I was just sitting there waiting to go in and get my prize, which was a long jean watch and a digital clock radio. And the guy says, would you like to hear your voice on tape? One of the DJs said, would you like to hear yourself on tape? You've ever heard, you have a nice voice. You want to hear, your, has anybody ever recorded your voice? He records me reading. I have been reading since I was three years old. He brings somebody else in and says, come listen to this kid read. I was 16. And then somebody else, come in and listen to this kid read. I was hired on the spot for a radio job when I was just going to pick up my prize. Now, people would say that's luck. I don't think it's luck. It's preparation, meeting the moment of opportunity, which is what Morehouse is doing for you.
had I not been a reader all of my life, had I not been speaking all of my life, who knew all of those speeches in the church? Who knew James Weldon Johnson was leading me to my own show? So again, I say, there is nothing happening to you. Everything is also happening for you. Any innovation, any success came from the security of being able to make decisions that felt right to me in the moment. And as I was saying earlier, every mistake I've made has been either a, mis either a choice that I made from my ego head, my head, where I didn't get silent or didn't get still or did get still and then still listen to what my head said instead of what my heart said. Because when you allow the voice of God, which is what your true, inst what your nature is, that's your true nature, since that's where you come from is the, cre is cre is the creator, that voice will speak through you if you allow it to. It cannot speak to you if the voices of you allow the voices of the world to drown that out. So I will say that every decision, every innovation, I mean, the big innovation for me was making a choice to own myself. So for many years, I was happy to have a job. And as I shared, I've shared many times is that when I was, I've made every salary. That's why I handle money so well. Because I've had no money and I've had a lot of money. And so I understand what it is. I understand what it is to, in the days where we actually had to write a check to the, to the gas company, and then you write another check to the phone company, and then I would, I would pretend, I would flip it like I didn't know I was sending the phone bill to the gas company. Because that would give you an extra week you know, to get your money straight. Uh, so, uh, in, 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 in all of those, those, those years, I was getting myself ready for the first million and then the first billion. And I will tell you the first billion is the hardest. And once you align yourself with, the, with what is really intended for you, the success, and the money shows up. I have never, ever, ever thought about how do I make money. Never thought about it. I, 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 I am not against people who do think about it, because I think if you do think about it, whatever you put your attention to, whatever you focus on expands. If that's what you're focused on, I've always thought about how can I be used and what's going to make me happy? What's going to make me feel truly successful? What's going to make me feel fulfilled? And I also knew that you don't get anywhere unless you have a spiritual life. And that means taking care of the spirit first. That means working on whatever it is that actually makes you, you. I mean, by spirit, the essence of who you are. And for some people, you know, I, 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 I meditate and go to church and walk in the woods and take quiet time. You know, bathing is a spiritual experience for me. So. Having time to your, for yourself so that you can drown out the voices of the world and hear what spirit actually wants to speak through you and for you is the most valuable tool, however you choose to pursue that, that you can ever give to yourself. Because you cannot give what you do not have. And what you're here to offer is the spirit life force of yourself. So what I understand is the reason why our show, I'm sorry to be so long in the question, but the reason why our show was so successful all those years is because I came to understand the common denominator in the human experience is that everybody watching was just like me. They all came from different backgrounds and it was so, it's thrilling to go in any place in the world and people say, I watch your show. But I know you're just like me. We have different stories, but you're just like me. Why? Because as a human being, first and foremost, what I want is what you want. And what you want is to rise, to do exactly what Morehouse is here to do, help you establish, to rise to the truest, highest expression of yourself as a human being. And that's what everybody wants. So when you know that, you can sit and you can create shows and you can build your team and you can do everything based upon what are we trying to achieve. We are trying to speak to this audience that wants to better themselves. 
How do we do that? Well, the way we did it was we just sit in a room and say, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want? My producers were young at the time that we started the show, and we built the show around what was going on in their lives and what was going on in their parents' lives because we all really shared this common denominator, this thread of a value system where we want to be better in our lives and our relationships and managing money and handling our kids and doing all of that stuff. So that's a long answer. I'm going to be shorter. For the next time. So, <laughs> so what are the... Yeah. So what are, what are the greatest risks of being successful? <sighs> Losing yourself in that is what I was saying earlier, is like believing your own publicity. Um, you know, I work really consciously at staying conscious. I work consciously at not, at not being led by my ego. I work consciously at not um, at losing sight of what is the real truth versus what everybody is saying and what people want. And, and I, listen, I have great empathy for you all living in the Instagram social media world, because it is a lot tougher than it was when I was your age. Having to try to measure yourself against people you don't even know who are posting things that are not even real, and then you all interpreting that and judging yourself against that, you know? So I have, I, I have regard for what you're up against, but will say, because you are up against a world that is judging you under false premises, that is putting out things that are you know, not real, that it is more essential now than ever to understand the spirit and value of who you really are. So your own personal identity is gonna mean so much more to you in this world than even, even when I, I was coming up. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and then um, I'll invite some of the scholars to come to Mike. Yeah. Uh, to ask you uh, some questions. And I love a fireside. <laughs> <laughs> Very simply, um, what's the legacy that you're hoping to leave? Oh, oh, I love this question. Boy, you just, it's like I asked you to ask that question. <laughs> I love this question so much. When I built my school, I would, came back to Maya Angelou's house. Was sitting in her kitchen. She was teaching me how to make biscuits. It was 2007, and I said, oh, Maya, that school is going to be my greatest legacy. And she put her dough down, and she said, you have no idea what your legacy is going to be. I said, oh, no, 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 the school's going to be it. I'm telling you. I just spent all this time in Nelson Mandela, and, I mean, he says it's going to be the legacy, and I'm telling you, you should see these girls. And she said, I said, you have no idea <laughs> what your legacy will be. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> she, she still, until her dying day, had the, had the ability to make me feel like a seven-year-old girl. And you know, at best, I was 11 in her presence. But I, I, she said, you have no idea what your legacy will be because your legacy is not one thing. Your legacy is every life you touch. Hmm. And that is, that's it, guys. You're building a legacy right now. If something unfortunate were to happen to you and you weren't able to continue in the dream, people would talk about the legacy you were, you left as a friend, the legacy in your family, the legacy as a, as a, as a classmate, the legacy as a, as a cousin, the legacy as a brother, as a, as, as a nephew, as an uncle. The, the legacy is not one thing. The legacy is everything. It's every life you touched. And Amaya went on to say, just as we were saying about these Morehouse men, mm. the beauty of the uh, Oprah scholars is that you, your life changed, the trajectory of your life changed when you came here to Morehouse. So my ability to impact that impacts you and impacts everybody you encounter. So the energy of my connection to you goes on in ways that I will never know. So I touch you, you will touch others, they will touch others, they will touch others, and that's the 10,000 I was talking about. Maya Angelou in her poem to our grandmothers says, um, 
when you, when, you, when you learn, teach, when you get, give. As for me, I shall not be moved. I come as one. I stand as 10,000. So the 10,000 is in everybody who ever prayed for you. Everybody who ever had a dream for you. Everybody who ever hoped there might be a better day. Everybody who ever thought one more load of laundry I'm going to do so my child could go to school. That was generations before you. One more load of laundry. I'm going to clean one more kitchen. I'm going to clean one more railroad car. Never imagining that there would be you, this class of Morehouse men, sitting in the space of life that you now hold. That's your 10,000. And you owe them. You owe them. You owe them. <laughs> Truly, the debt that was paid. You know, Maya always said, and this is because Jimmy Baldwin told her, and then she told me, and then that your crown has been paid for. They paid for it. All you got to do is put it on your head and wear it. And so the wearing of the crown, how you choose to wear that crown now, that's, that's, that's the great gift. And the wearing of the crown, I feel like I've worn the crown. You know, so when people call me queen, I go, yes. <laughs> I feel like I earned it. I feel like I hold the space for wearing it well. And the legacy is not one thing. It's everything. It's yeah. every life. Well, the, the, the metaphor of the crown yeah. fits well with Morehouse College. One of our greatest alumnus, the theologian Howard Thurman. Oh, I love Howard um, Thurman. Created a, a, an idea, really, that Morehouse places a crown above the heads of its students and asks them to grow into it. Whoa. To grow to wear it. That's so the crown crazy. metaphor. So let's open it up. Um, for... I'm curious, just, can I ask a question? I yep. can't stop myself. Um, like, you've been here 22 months. I've been here 22 months. What was the, and they did a lot of wooing and trying to get you, what was the moment and the reason, not the moment, but what was the driving force behind the reason that you said yes to come to this institution to stand in the shoes of so many before you? What was the reason? The reason? The reason. The reason was that... Um, was in the context of me turning 60 years old uh -huh. and thinking that I have another 10 years to run hard. Mm. And um, I had several opportunities. Um, and uh, Morehouse came knocking, and I thought to myself, if I can be as successful at Morehouse as I have been in every other aspect of my career, I can change the world. Mm. Okay, another question. Um, <laughs> another question. I did this show. <laughs> okay. I always wanted to be on your show, too. I know, I know. I did show. So, so I did a show once uh, with um, fathers, a room filled with fathers. And this uh, young black man stood up and he said, every father has a dream for his family whether I think this was a show really about men who'd left their children or something he said every father has a dream for his family and when the man cannot fulfill that dream he feels that he's let down himself and many men cannot handle that and they leave because they they cannot they they can't see a way through to fulfill the dream so you have come here to fulfill a dream for these men who now become sons of Morehouse. I want to know what the real dream is. What, what the real dream is. What the real dream yeah, is? Yeah, not the motto, not the phrase, not the vision statement, not the da, not the da da da. <laughs> what is the real dream when you go to bed at night and you think about these young men and I, you know, I run a school with not as many 
students as you all have here, but you carry their stories with you. You carry their dreams with you, their struggles with you, and sometimes they keep you up because everybody ain't in alignment, is not in alignment. <laughs> um, forgot where I was, sorry. Uh, everybody's not, is not in alignment. So <laughs> the, the dream that you hold and the, from the things that keep you up at night is? The dream that I hold is that um, each of these young men who are students under my watch, who are sons of mine, will find their purpose and their passion and feel that they could not have done whatever they will go do in the world without having come through Morehouse. Mm. And um, that is the history of Morehouse. When you talk to our alumni, mm -hmm. uh, many of them, if not all of them say, uh, Morehouse transformed me. If it wasn't for Morehouse. Mm -hmm. um, they go off, it's proven by our alums, they go off to every corner of the world and rise to you know, positions of leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one, one, uh, and so that's what I want to continue. That's what I want to have happen. But, you know, I want to also transform this experience for them so that it is truly a 21st century experience. Mm -hmm. Right. If, and that's what keeps me up at night. Right. Mm -hmm. We know that what we did in the 20th century helped yeah. to change the world. Yeah. Now, what can I do to make sure that we change the 21st century for the better? For them. Okay, final question. Then I'll take yours. Okay. One of the things that got me uh, to build a, a girls' school is because I saw myself in the faces and in the hearts of those girls. I want to know, how do you see yourself in the faces I am there. of... My, my, my story, my Morehouse story goes back uh, more than 50 years. Okay. I wanted to go to Morehouse College from the time I was 10 years old and read that Martin Luther King had gone to Morehouse College. No one in my family, no one in my extended family had finished college. My parents didn't finish high school. My father told me that if I didn't want to do the kind of work he did, I needed to go to college. I didn't know what college was. I knew I was going. I got this image from this guy, Martin Luther King, who had gone here. I said, I'm going to Morehouse College. I only applied to two places. Morehouse College and another school. There wasn't an Oprah Winfrey scholarship. I couldn't go to Morehouse because I couldn't afford it. Went to the other place. Uh, so I see myself in every one of these young men. I have sons. Mm. I have 30 year old, I have a 28 year old and a 23 year old son. Uh, I see them every time I walk out of my house, which is right here on campus, every morning. Uh, I think to myself, I've got 2,000 young men here, and one of them, if not more, will be my Martin Luther King. Mm. I don't know who he is. Uh, well, Mar Colton, Colton's going to be a, a country singing president, so. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I, I hope I'm around to see it. I hope, I hope I'm around to see the inauguration, Colton. Great. Yeah. Okay. We're going to open up the floor for questions thank you, now. Thank you, for, thank you for letting me do that. That's great. Okay. And uh, please um, keep your questions short, I'll not statements, short. questions. Okay. Good, after, good afternoon. Hi. I am George Anthony Pratt, freshman history major, hailing from Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville. I would first like to thank you, Dr. Winfrey, for taking time out of your schedule to be with to be here with us today, Loving and also it. all of your philanthropic co contributions to the world to try to make it a better place, specifically the opportunities of advancement and education you provide for the men of Morehouse. Thank you. In the series, David Makes Man, we see David uh, struggle with the uh, death of Sky, and we see him grapple with his identity. And so in this breakdown of his psyche, he develops this coping mechanism, and we see the physical uh, manifestation of Sky, but it is really a figment of his imagination. What about David's story do you think speaks to the experience 
of the adolescent uh, men of African diaspora in America, and why do you think th exploring themes like this is important to mainstream media? Thank you. Oh, I love that. You all should have Ter Terrell McCraney here to go in depth, because he wrote David Makes Man, created David Makes Man, also did Moonlight. Uh, I wanted to do that story because I think uh, we all who've come out of the African-American experience have come through a level of trauma that the rest of the world is not even yet uh, open to understanding. So I wanted to be able to have a show about trauma without saying I'm doing a show that's about trauma and I wanna educate you all. So I wanted to show the life through narrative uh, of David's story and the complexities of what it means to grow up in uh, an, an environment filled with uh, inner city challenges, filled with uh, death, filled with not knowing when you're gonna be shot or if you would be shot, filled with drugs, filled with violence, but also filled with um, what makes home home and being able to look at people from various uh, backgrounds within that community in a way that there could be appreciation for all of the diverse characters. So I wanted to show America what it's like for, to, to grow up as a young black boy uh, when you don't have everything that you need and you're surrounded by a lot of conflict and to do that in a way that was enlightening as well as entertaining. That was the goal. Okay, next. Thank you. Go Thank to you. the next question. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Hey. Winfrey, uh, President Thomas. My name is Kenny Zamore. Um, for one, I'm sitting here and uh, listening to uh, the fruitful um, advice that you've been given. I always like the, I always see that the beauty of success is um, its ambiguity. And um, it, it's what? I didn't get that word. Ambiguity. Okay, ambiguity, yeah. yeah. And uh, in terms of speaking to my mother, in terms of my choice of coming to Morehouse College, I wanted to ask you, do you agree with the idea that the future class of African American men and leaders should stir away from really looking at what is success and more in terms of self-fulfillment and self-actualization? Absolutely, the, the, the latter. I think you know my role has been, you know, and Stedman's written several books about it and we actually taught together at Kellogg and, he and I disagree. I, I, you know, I think you do need vision. I didn't really have one. Uh, I'm a perfect example of somebody who has lived in the moment and let each moment lead me to the next. So I never had an idea that I wanted a talk show. I never had an idea that I even wanted to be in television. I just, in every moment, applied the principle of excellence, which I learned in the third grade when I turned in my book report earlier than everyone else. I saw the teacher's reaction. My third grade teacher, everybody remember their third grade teacher, right? We all know their names. My name's Miss Driver. So Miss Driver told all the other, because this is what happens in the teacher's lounge, they all talk about you. And uh, they talk about you if you're a problem, and they talk about you if you're doing well. So by the time I learned this lesson in the fourth grade, oh, they talk about you. Because when I got to the fourth grade, the fourth grade teacher said, oh, you're that kid that loves to read. You're that kid that turns in your, your, your book reports early. So I have always been propelled by the idea of excellence. I heard Jesse Jackson speak when I was a sophomore in high school. And he said in that speech, it was a down with do dope, up with hope speech, and he also said, excellence is the best deterrent to racism. Excellence is the best deterrent to sexism. Therefore, be excellent. I wrote that down in the auditorium that day at 15 years old. I went home and put it on my mirror and that became like my mantra. So, and this is the truth. If you are excellent, even if you are the guy who is just making the fries at McDonald's, but yours are the crispiest, people wanna come to your line. You do. It rises to the top no matter what you're doing. And what I know to be true is that you can make a plan, but God always has a bigger plan. And so I try to live, the reason why I have been successful beyond my wildest dreams 
is because I had a dream, but God had a bigger dream. And you have to be willing to lean into what is God's dream for you. That's the question. That's the question. And you get the answer about how can you be used in service. My show shifted in 1989, actually about the same time that I came and gave to Morehouse for the first time. The show shifted when I asked this question of how do I use myself in this platform for something that's bigger than myself? If you get that question answered, you will be led to the highest ground. And when God tells you to do something, he is not sending you to that mission. He takes you to that mission. So when you understand that, you, want, you, you get everything. Lean in. Lean in to the dream. There's a dream. There's a dream for everybody in here, and your dream is not his dream. And everybody gets hung up because you want your dream to be his dream, and you think that he's, you know, if you look at Instagram, you think everybody's dream is just coming true. Mm -hmm. It's not, not the case. There is a dream for you. So when I talk about there is a flow to your life and your real responsibility, your real job is figuring out who you are in relation to your ancestors and the line, the legacy that you now have gotten to carry forward, what that means for you, and how can you now serve. That's what we're here to do. We're here to figure out how to use your talent, your gifts, what you have that nobody else has in the same way that you have it. And how do you now turn that into a service that other people can experience? That's, that's, that's the deal. Yes. Dr. Winfrey, first of all, we miss you in Chicago. Well, thank you. Yes. I do not miss, it's getting ready to turn cold. I do not miss the cold. <laughs> I don't want to be there now. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you bring up uh, Jesse Jackson. I uh, talk to him about this all the time at the uh, Saturday morning uh, mm -hmm. push forums. Um, in politics, you see a lot of the policies that are negatively affecting, you know, my brothers here uh, are people uh, of color, really, and I've spoken to Dr. Thomas about this, about, you know, support for HBCUs from the government and various things that are just affecting all of us in very, very mm -hmm. different ways. Um, there's a whole bunch of rumors about you in politics. I'm not going to go into that, but just wh wh where do you see yourself? You know, you talk about this, uh, you know, God having a higher calling for you and being able to use you or a, a higher being being able to use you. Where do you see yourself in politics or, you know, just contributing to the things that are affecting people on the political level? Well. You know, a, a lot of people have asked me to run for president, and even people have called, uh, called me up and said, thank you. <laughs> Not happening. Um, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I would have to say, I have a high regard for myself in that I know the difference between voices of the world and the voice of God. I, I, know, I know what that is. And I have said, even to my best friend Gail, who's like, wouldn't you do it for the country? I would do it for the country if I felt it was God-led through me. And so I said, Jesus is gonna have to tell me, and it's gonna have to be, <laughs> it's gonna have to be in plain English, it's gonna have to be so clear, it's not gonna have to be like a sign. And so I do not feel in any part of my being, and I, so many people have brought it up to me, like, you know, rich people calling me and saying, I will run your campaign, I will get you a billion dollars for your campaign, I will do that. I mean, like seriously, it has happened so often that I said, I literally went out to what I call my apostles, because uh, I live at a place I call the promised land. It is the promised land. Um, and so all different parts of the property are, you know, named after various um, uh, praise uh, uh, values that I hold. And so I have these 12 trees in a grove where I go to meditate and be in silence or just be or read. And so I actually went to the apostles sitting on the apostles said, okay, Jesus, if you got something for me, you got to tell me now. <laughs> um, and so I, it's not happening for me. That is not where I can best serve, but I am asking the question and I know the answer will show itself. Tell me what you want me to do. Tell me how I can be used in service. I don't think it's getting into this malay. I don't think it's like standing on a podium and you know running for president. 
if there were to be somebody who showed themselves, I felt that I was led to get behind them. I would also, I would also do that, you know, I would do that. And I'm also talking to a couple of people I know behind the scenes who I think should get in it, who would want to do that. But that isn't my role. My role is not to be president of the country. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Cool. Okay. Hello, Dr. Winfrey. My <laughs> name is Nick Cummings. Yeah, junior I remember Nick. Computer science major I remember Nick. Yes. From Miami, Florida. Um, so my personal question is: My dream in life is to revolutionize our community with blockchain and artificial intelligence technology. Ooh. And for that to happen, understand that empathy at scale is going to be the biggest factor. In empathy at scale. Yes. Yeah. And that's something you're really good at yeah. in so many different ways. So my question is, how would you suggest that I employ empathy at scale now and moving forward in developing myself? And how would you suggest the college do that in terms of moving forward as well? Empathy at scale. Nick, that is a question I've never been, I've never pondered. Hmm. Oh. I'll be thinking about that one. Um, I, I really, I, I really don't know the answer. Um, I would have to say that the common denominator that I was able to express empathy toward the audience and this and, and all of that was also coming back at me was understanding that there was a common denominator in the human experience, and that is that everybody wants to be heard. So when you get that, that everybody is looking for the same thing, you can, everybody's looking to be heard and everybody's looking to be validated. So um, I learned this through the show where every single time I would finish an interview, I started to see the thread. Like you all have a thread in your life that started from the time you have a memory. And that thread, so the thread I noticed in the show is that after every guest, no matter who the guest was, they would say, is that okay? How was that? We'd finish the show and they'd say, is that okay? How was that? I do all right? It's okay? Obama's like, good, good. Uh, Beyonce is like, was that all right? After she just taught me how to twerk. You are Beyonce, it's all very fine. Um, and, and that happened no matter who I was talking to. And I started to see, uh, like wonder, why does everybody say the same thing? Because everybody just wants to know. Was it okay? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything to you? So the common denomination in the, that human experience, in the being able to understand and to empathize, is to know that the thing that you're looking for in the core of yourself is the same thing everybody else is looking for in the core of themselves. No different. So you're trying to hit that common nerve. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick, for stomping me on the question. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Ms. Winfrey. My Good name evening. is Jalen Lowe. I'm a senior psychology major here at the college from Eden, North Carolina. And my question is to you, um, during some of your low points in life, uh, what are some of the things you did or relied on to help you out of those places? Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're going to be a good psychologist, right? You're going to... Uh, like... Um, my lowest point was making the decision to go ahead with the own network while I was still doing the Oprah show and thinking that I could do both. And I got hit with all kinds of negative, Oprah, you should have kept your day job, you should have done that. And I started to question myself. And the, the thing that turned me around was exactly what I what I'd said to you all earlier. You, you have to ask each experience, what are you here to teach me? So when you're at your lowest point, you have to say, why is this here? What is it here to teach me? And if you still don't hear the answer, it's like, what am I not getting? Because it's there, it's showing up for you. It's not happening to you, because whatever it is, you have created. It's in your life because you created it. What let, thank you, can I get a witness? In your life, because you created it, 
Why did you create it? What was going on with you that led you to make those decisions? You know, before I chose to move uh, out of the Oprah show and into the own network, the question I kept asking was, is it an ego decision? Am I just hung up on OWM? Am I just hung up on having my name on a network? Because I know if that is it, I am, I am going to fail. So God, I don't want it to be a decision that's based upon anything that's, going to, that's about highlighting myself or my personality. Let it be driven by how can I use this platform in order to speak to an audience that I was not able to speak to on the Oprah Winfrey Show? How can I speak differently? How can I be more innovative in a way that I hadn't been able to do sitting and talking to people? So the answer to the question is, when I'm at my lowest points, the first thing I do is ask why, but not why in a judgmental or accusatory way, but why in deep search of what is it about me that has created this? And then I go into um, prayer and meditation about it. I mean, it, it's not like, oh, Jesus, help me, help me, help me, because I know Jesus is saying, well, you did it. <laughs> you did it. But this is what I have found. You all are going to have problems if you continue to live. You're going to make mistakes if you continue to live. At some point, you're going to be in a crisis because you didn't listen to the whispers. So I have learned that life first speaks to you in a whisper. And a whisper is really like this. It's like, hmm, that's strange. It's really, it just feels like, hmm, that's odd. That don't make no sense. Hmm. I don't think so. Hmm. It's just, it's tiny. It's tiny. And if you don't pay attention to that little feeling that's just like, hmm. Hmm. It gets louder. And the hmm is always trying to bring you a message. It's trying to let you know something's off. And if you don't get it in the whisper, you get thumped upside the head. You get like pebbles upside your head. And some people in the message, in the, by the time you're getting pebbles, now you got yourself a problem because now you got little knots upside your head because you didn't listen. Most people are brick people. They got to get hit over the head with a whole brick. By the time you're into brick mode, you not just, don't just have a problem. You're in crisis because you didn't act on the problem and you didn't listen to the message. And if you don't handle the crisis, we all know you end up in a disaster. So what I have tried to do over the years before I get to that moment of crisis is listen to the, hmm, that's odd. That doesn't make any sense. And Maya's greatest teaching to me was people show you who they are, believe them the first time. So the first time, the first time you actually feel Hmm, that means something's up. And those of us who've learned to lean into that, that actually is called, called wisdom because you, you, you get to know something's off here. Let me course correct right now. Because a person that you kind of feel something's off with will always, always, always show you later, but usually it's when it's become a problem. So hope I answered and double answered. Thank you. Answered and double answered. Yes, I'll be quicker. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Jamari Stanton, sophomore of political science and economics, double major from Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh. Go. I actually had to uh, write my question in my notes. Okay. I was actually taking notes on while you were speaking. Yeah. And the main thing that you were talking about with Dr. Thomas that really stood out to me was your spirituality. Yeah. What would you say really influenced this? And what stage were you at in your life when it really like, dawned on you the importance of maintaining like a healthy spirit? Well, I was always in the church, but God was in a box. I thought God was just like with a tablet watching everything I did. He was, you know, the white man with the long beard or Jesus on that calendar that all the grandmothers had in their house. Um, and it wasn't until I did the movie The Color Purple in 1985 that I would say I moved into a, a deeper understanding of what God was. And what I, and I learned a lot of that from the actual experience of filming The Color Purple and also of what Seeley and Suge say about God 
loving appreciation and that God is in everything and God is inside of you and God is all that. But really what taught me is watching Alice Walker, Steven Spielberg, and Quincy Jones working on that movie set and the feeling I got working on that movie set. So I'll make this as quick as possible. I had come to Chicago. I was working. I had prayed, 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 prayed after reading the book, The Color Purple, that somehow I could be a part of that film. Prayed, like on my knees praying. And a year passed, I heard nothing. I get a call in my office, this is just prayer, I don't know one single human being in the movie business. I get a call in my office in Chicago saying we want you to come audition for a movie. And, I, and, they say, and it was Ruben Cannon, who still lives in Atlanta, and, and he says, we want you to come, inter, uh, want you to come uh, audition for this film. I said, is it the color purple? He said, no, it's, it's uh, something called Moon Song. I said, well, I've been praying for the color purple. I don't know nothing about no Moon Song. <laughs> so I go to audition. This is after a year. This is a year after I have bought the book, read the book, and literally start praying to God if there's ever a movie. I don't know anything about the movie business. I go to the movies and I see that the last credit on the movie is something called Best Boy. So I think I'm gonna convince whoever does this movie that I can be the best girl. I did not know at the time that a best boy is an electrician, so I would have had a hard time doing that. But anyway, pray, 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 pray. In comes a call. I go to audition. Of course, it's the color purple. I've read the book three times. I know when I walk in and read the audition. I go and I don't hear anything from Reuben Cannon for three months about the color purple. I call up Reuben Cannon, happens to be an African-American man, and I say, Reuben, I'm sorry, Mr. Cannon, I haven't heard from you. And he says, uh, I call you, you don't call me. And I didn't call you. Do you know I have real actresses who just left my office right now? You know who just left my office? Alfred Woodard. I have real actresses who auditioned for this part. So I think, okay, I'm not gonna get it. I'm not gonna get it, I'm not gonna get it. I hang up the phone, I'm crying. I think, rude Mr. Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cannon, that was so rude. Okay, so I go away to this fat farm because I think the reason I'm not getting the part is because I'm so overweight, okay? So I go to the fat farm. I think maybe if I lose 15 pounds in three days, they can, if I, if I do the green juice and a colonic, I can lose enough weight and I can get the part, okay? So I'm literally out on the track praying to God to help me release the color purple help me release the desire to be in the color purple because it's now made me crazy. I'm obsessed with it, I'm obsessed with it, I'm obsessed with it. Reuben Cannon has told me that he had real actresses. I've never acted in a movie in my life. Real actresses are gonna get it. So I start running around the track, praying and crying to let it go. Praying and crying to let it go. And I start singing, I surrender all. I surrender all, all to thee. You know the song. I sing and I pray and I pray and I cry and I sing and I go around and around. And you know how you pray sometimes and then you say, let, I want to let this burden, I want to lay this burden down, but you still have it. You can still feel you have it. <laughs> I'm praying, but I still got it. Mm. So I pray and I cry and I sing some more. So I'm singing and praying and crying until I feel the release. And the release came when I was able to say, I bless Alfre Woodard. Up until that moment, I was like, I ain't gonna be able to see her. I can't never see her. I can't see nobody take the role. That was my role. I know I should have had that role. And the moment I say, you know, I'm gonna bless Alfre Woodard. If it's not for me, I bless whoever it is that gets that role. And I feel the release. I feel the release. And I'm telling you, in an instant, I turn around and this woman comes running out and she said, there's a phone call for you. And who's on the phone? It's Reuben Cannon who lied and said he was Steven Spielberg. So Reuben Cannon, who says, because he thought I'd, I wouldn't come to the phone if it was him. So he comes to the phone, I come to the phone and he says, Steven Spielberg wants to see you in his office tomorrow morning and I hear you're at a fat farm. If you lose a pound, you could lose this part. So, honey, I stopped as a Dairy Queen. <laughs> true, 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 true story, no exaggeration. And I will tell you, that moment, 
I felt it so clearly in my spirit that the moment I released pushing against the thing that I thought I wanted the most, the moment I say, God, you take it, I can't handle it anymore, I really don't know what to do any longer, that instant you do that, that's when it changed. So that changed my, I, I, I realized something else is happening here in the whole spiritual world that I'm connected to and we are connected to. So I learned for every trial that I was going through, do all that you can do, do what you can, release it to the force and power that's greater than yourself. And then what's supposed to happen happens. So that's, that's, that's it, that's life, that's it. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Winfrey. Um, my name is Gregory Hollis, and I'm a biology major um, from Washington, D.C. So I actually have two questions. You only yeah. get one. Really fast. Okay. You only get um, one. I'll, I'll do quick. I'll do quick. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you. Okay. So no, quick. no, no, no. But to be honest, like, okay, I lied to you not. When I stepped on this campus August 6th, I said, Oprah Winfrey is going to eventually come here. And I emailed Dr. Jan Adams that day, a year ago, before any word that you were even coming to campus to make sure that my spot was solidified here. So I've been waiting for this for about over 12 months. So just like, just throw it out there. Okay. I got it. So my first question, I'm a firm believer that um, you miss 100% of the opportunities that you don't take advantage of. Yeah. And I wanted to know, um, post this conversation, can I please get a picture with you? Sure. Okay. And then my second question is, um, this summer I actually did, um, I spent six weeks in Cape Town, South Africa, yeah. where I was conducting research um, regarding the intergenerational trauma post the apartheid regime. Woo. And um, I was at the University of Cape Town and I had a illuminating experience um, in which, you know, I was just immersed in the culture. And I wanted to know, um, at first, before going, I didn't understand why out of all the places in the world um, you had started a girls' school in South Africa until I had gone. And I just saw the value that education had and the indiscrepancies that were put in place to hinder specifically black girls from receiving education. And I wanted to know, um, what exactly is your greatest hope for the country of South Africa, mm. and um, in particular, with your vision for your school. My vision was, as I shared with the, uh, my sons earlier, was that um, I had spent 10 days at Nelson Mandela's house, and we had gone all over the multiple provinces, and I wanted to be able to offer a gift to him, and I had been trying and trying and trying in the United States to find the right charity, the right organization, the right thing to do. And I had watched the women carrying baskets of wood on their head, basket, working, 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 working. And I said to uh, Nelson Mandela that I believe the women are gonna save this country. That's how you're gonna change the trajectory of this country is, is through the voices and hearts and souls of, of, of the women. And so my dream was to create, to do exactly what Dr. Adams was saying here earlier, was to incubate leaders so that when the moment was primed, those girls can step into leadership positions. So one of the greatest gifts, you know, like I met somebody here who was a Morehouse uh, scholar. I think there are probably others who've come back and, t and taught. One of the greatest visions for me is that one day one of the girls who I've schooled comes back and runs that school. Another dream is that they use their leadership skills and however they are led by the divine to manifest power and uh, a quality of being in the world that changes the way that country sees itself. So I believe that one of our girls will eventually, won't be a country singing president, but will be president of the country. And however they manifest leadership in their lives, that they are stronger, more powerful, uh, and um, worthy filled women. That's the dream. That's the dream. Thank you. And where do I meet you for the picture? Uh, back there. Okay. Got it. Got it. It's a bold brother. I love it. Good afternoon, Dr. Winfrey. My name is Olufemi Yesufu. I'm a freshman dual engineering major from Columbia, Maryland. Yeah. First of all, I want to say that um, my mom's a huge fan. So if I didn't tell you, if I didn't tell you that, she would kill me. Okay. You know. 
All right. So my question was, being a black business owner and or black business owner or entrepreneur in America, I've had a lot of people tell me that throughout their journey, a lot of a lot more white men, white women help them throughout their journey than other successful black uh, business owners. Um, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You wrote the question down. Okay. A lot of successful black business owners and entrepreneurs reveal that throughout their journey, white people have helped them mm -hmm. and gave them a helping hand than other black people. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about that and how has that affected you personally? Um, I don't think I have been affected by that personally because, um, as I started to share earlier, the big decision for me was in 1988 or 89, I was still, quote, owned or had a job uh, by the network, by ABC Network, ABC Television Network at the time. And I made a decision in late 1988 that I would take over ownership for myself. And that means I would take the risk if it worked, and if it didn't work, then I wouldn't make any money. I don't want your salary, I said. I don't want anybody's salary. I want to split it in half. So whatever you get, I get. And if it doesn't work, then I will live with that. And by the time we finished the show in 2011, you know, and I'd done multiple contracts since then, by the time we finished, I wasn't getting half, I was getting like 92%. So I set up a system that was, was win for me so that I didn't have to depend on anybody else investing in me or doing anything. I took the chance on myself. I took the gamble on myself because I believed, number one, as we were talking about empathy, I believed that what we were doing with the Oprah Show audience in Chicago when we first started in 86, and people were saying it wasn't gonna work in other parts of the country, I knew that it would. Because I know that people have the same hearts in Chicago as they do in Atlanta, as they do in Memphis, as they do in Australia, and all other parts of the world, and so that's why it worked. So I would say, create a situation where you have the ability to Gamble on, take the risk for, invest in yourself so that you're not dependent on somebody else, white or black, doing it for you. Could I also come back and take a picture with you, please? Okay. Well, nope, only he gets it because he had the courage to ask first. Okay, okay. Right, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Because <laughs> everybody want a picture, but he's the one to say it first, so there you go. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Winfrey. Uh, my name is Jameson Floyd. I'm a senior physics major from Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, with so much success in your career and with new um, endeavors and projects you're doing, how do you like maintain and manage your old relationships and decide on which new ones to foster? Um, I, I actually continue to ask that question, how can I be used? So I'm most excited that uh, I leave here and I go to Washington, D.C., and ta Coates and I are filming our first platform experience for Apple that will be, will be streamed on Apple November 1st. I'm most excited that last Monday, I think it was, I announced ta Coates' Water Dancer as, as my uh, book club selection for Apple. Immediately went to number one, so he's number one on the New York Times bestseller for, for print, for ebook, for whatever. And that novel should be read by every man in Morehouse, The Water Dancer. And so my goal was to take what I had done before on the Oprah show with books and make it global and create the world's largest book club so that you get um, people throughout the world not just discussing bu books, but discussing ideas behind the books. So I love ta book because although it's a book about this uh, young s slave man who uses his powers of, uh, his mysterious powers of conduction to um, war against the, the, the conditions of the time, it's really about what's happening now. And so this new platform for Apple, Apple which is in a billion pockets, which means you get to broaden your ability to speak to more people around the world, this is my way of having a conversation about race, reparations, what's happened to black people in our culture without saying, I wanna to talk to y'all about some history. So I think the book is the way in, I think movies are a way in, I think um, television shows are a way in. And so this new platform, being able to speak to people who have phones in a billion pockets, 
was, was a conscious choice because I wanted to be able to share ideas that were important to me. So this book is gonna be obviously about race and the conversation will be about race and touching people in a way that's really unexpected. So I, I, I now you know, have tr you know, I did 25 years of trying to speak directly to people about various issues. I can see that that's not the way they can hear it. So however I can present it to you, that the message can be re received is what I'm now looking for. And so technology now gives us an opportunity to do that in multiple ways. Thank so, you. So doc Dr. Winfrey, I, I just wanna check in with you so you don't overrule me again, but uh, time. Are you, I'm are you fine, good to go? I'm gonna finish up th with these gentlemen. All right, I've been standing great. there, okay. okay. Good. Good afternoon, Dr. Winfrey. My Thank name, you. My name is Marcellus Kirkland. I'm Marcellus. a sophomore in sociology major from Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, one thing you alluded to, the sentiment of everything is for a reason. Yeah. All of your experiences are for a reason. Uh -huh. uh, that is something that resonated with me uh, immensely. And But my question to you is how are you able to deal with the negative experiences and in Ooh. doing so, able to search for the keys to your success within those negative experiences while allowing yourself to go through that pain, which is necessary for your growth as a person, as a leader, as a servant leader, as a vessel forward through, as a vessel through which the Lord works. How are you able to deal with that pain necessary for your growth in a way that isn't detrimental to you as a person mm -hmm. while also still able to unpack and, and search for those keys that's hidden within that pain? Search for those lessons. Well, you know, you're asking this question as somebody who is familiar with doing the work. So you obviously, have you done some therapy work? Have you done some, have you? Uh, I do a lot of mentorship work with yeah. you. Yeah, so I think that, you know, as I've said before, the fundamental is having a spiritual life. And spirit to me means the essence of yourself doing the work that is required to, first of all, acknowledge the pain of your past. Because so many African Americans um, don't even recognize the trauma that we've been through. We're just so used to carrying the burden, we just think the burden is all ours. And so you have to do the work to unpack actually what has caused you to feel the anger and the pain that you feel. And then do the work that helps you release that. And that is an ongoing process, but I will tell you that the acknowledgement that you have the pain and recognizing the source from which it uh, emanates uh, is really crucial. And then being willing to, when it shows up, look it in the face and, 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 and uh, acknowledge it for what it is and not let it control all of your other actions. Because a lot of people burst out in anger or have responses based on something that's been going on in them, that's unresolved in them. So that rage and that anger shows up in other ways in their life. It is your job to fix you. That's your primary work on earth, is to make yourself whole. Not to make yourself perfect because the nature of being a human being is that we are all here as yin and yang imperfect beings. But to make yourself whole. So you use the wholeness and fullness of that to offer to other people. That's the work. And you, your, your job is to figure out how that, is, how that shows up for you. For some people it's going to church and for some people it's meditation and it's spiritual work. For some people it's a combination. For some people it's running. For some people it's you know exercise. Whatever it is you need to do to highlight and bring out whatever it is um, that needs to be resolved. Because those thorns are always there until you release them. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you once more for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So happy. Good afternoon, Ms. Winfrey. Hi. Uh, my name is Steven Seymour. I'm a junior electrical engineer major from Nassau, the Bahamas. Uh, one of my observations when you spoke this this morning to the Oprah Winfrey scholars was that you intentionally were instilling in us a mindset, right? Uh, at least that's my observation. So my question to you Intentionally is, were what is the mindset? Instilling in us a, a mindset. mindset as to how we should view life and grow. So my question to you is I know, you know, I'm 20 years old. At 30, I'm not going to have the same mindset that I do now. At 50, I'm not going to have the same mindset that I had at 30. 
my question is, how do you constantly evolve yourself to get to the next level, even after you've seen a lot of success? Okay, so here's the thing that changed everything for me. About 1989, again, everything seems to be in alignment with Coming Morehouse. It was about 1989 that I came across a book called The Seat of the Soul. And up until that time, I was always, uh, I had what you call, what I call the disease to please. Uh, my life really wasn't my own. And if your life isn't your own and you are doing things that other people want you to do instead of doing what you want to do, you are still a slave. You are still a slave. Because each person is here to order themselves. And I, I, I did a, a, a movie called Beloved many years ago, and one of my favorite lines from Toni Morrison's Beloved is when the character that I play, Setha, says, freedom is waking up in the morning and deciding for yourself what to do with the day. Can you imagine that? You get to decide for yourself what to do with the day, which was a, a foreign concept for somebody who had been um, in, 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 enslaved all those years. And so the decision to, um, make, to make yourself a completely free person and not be dominated by other people's ideas about who you wanted to be. So that book, Seat of the Soul, and the chapter on intention changed everything for me. So whether you become super successful or accomplish all of your dreams, your dreams change, you know? If you're growing, it's gonna, you're like, oh, I thought I wanted that. I will tell you this, for years I thought I wanted to go to Broadway. All the time I was doing the Oprah show and couldn't be on Broadway, I thought, I just wanna go to Broadway. When I finally got a chance to go to Broadway, I realized I don't really wanna go to Broadway because I don't wanna do eight shows a week, I don't wanna live in New York, there's a lot of, I, I really, if they can move Broadway to Los Angeles, I would do it. But I really don't wanna, I realize, oh, that's, that's just something I had in my head that's an idea I had in my head. But here's the thing, if I leave you with nothing else, intention determines outcome. Intention determines, you know, so earlier today I was talking about the third law of motion in physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, Nick. And before there is the action, there is the intention behind the action. The intention is the driving motivational force behind the action. The driving motivational force is what determines the outcome. So when you are clear about what you intend, not just what you want, because you do not get in life what you want, you get in life what you have prepared and have intentionally designed for yourself. Intention is everything. So I don't do one thing in life since 1989 without considering what is my intention for doing it. And this is the reason why I was saying earlier, I have to keep checking, is this my ego? Is this my ego? Because I know an ego is gonna make me fall flat on my face. I am not gonna succeed if it's done out of anything other than the purest reason for trying to have the accomplishment. So regardless of where you are in the ladder of success, check your intention. And the intention always comes back, and this is the question that most people cannot answer for themselves. What do I want? What do I want? Most people are answering that question based on what their mama wanted, what society says you're supposed to have, what everybody else says. That's why the spiritual life is the most important life. Because you can't know what you want unless you have clarity of your own identity, of what your voice is versus everybody else's. That is why I know I'm not gonna be president. If every single person in the United States today wrote me an email and said, we want you to be president, that still could not move me because I know that's not what I want, nor is it what God wants for me. So I am very clear about what the intention is, and that changes everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Almost done. Hi, I'm Cody Harris. Once Hi, again. Cody. Um, sophomore biology major from Atlanta, Georgia. So one thing that I was wondering, hearing you talk today about the work you've done in South Africa, 
What new things have you learned about yourself since, and how have they shifted what you consider to be your life purpose? Uh, I learned it's hard building a school from scratch, and that it's not about uh, bricks and mortar. It's about the uh, building the infrastructure and having everybody who's a part of that in infrastructure have the vision. So this is important for you as you create your businesses. Everybody gets all caught up on the physical thing and what that physical thing looks like. It's about starting from the heart and soul of whatever it is you're doing. Whatever you're doing has to be built from the inside out. From the inside out, not from the outside in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I learned. I did it backwards. I started with so excited about the school and the building. Oh my God. Oh, little. Yeah, and then I, I suffered because of it. Yes. Good afternoon, Ms. Oprah. Martin. Yes. My name is Kareem Moore. I'm a graduating senior business management major from Queens, New York. So I'm a young philanthropist and entrepreneur. And um, I, too, have a kind of sort of system where I give back scholarships to my high school in New York. That's great. So I wanted to ask you for advice for someone who's young like me who's trying to go through philanthropy and entrepreneurship and has so many ideas and want to help so many people, but yet I don't know where to start sometimes because my ideas are so broad. And being that um, graduation is approaching, sometimes I feel that a lot of um, both me and my peers feel that we have to have it all figured out now. So you don't. What advice would you have? Oh, that's my, my, uh, my biggest advice is your 20s are about figuring it out. So don't spend one moment in your 20s saying, I should have it all done. That's the story you told yourself, which is a lie. Because the 20s are about trying things, figuring out if it works, it doesn't work, doesn't feel good there. And you may take several jobs that you really do not like. <laughs> Somebody's here had a few. Several jobs that you really don't like, that you're really uncomfortable. I don't know where your generation got the idea that you're supposed to graduate and have the job of your dreams. That is a story that somebody told you that is not true. You are supposed to do exactly what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. And, uh, and the truth of the matter is, you know, I just watched Tyler Perry yesterday opened this magnificent studio that is larger, grander, bigger than any studio in the world. When he was 25, 26, 28, he was living out of his car. And so it takes time, making mistakes, learning from that mistake, making the mistake over again, wearing a different pair of pants, for it to show up again and again and again, for you to realize, oh, oh, here's my lane, here's the flow. So what Tyler has been able to do is to figure out, this is the audience I serve, I know these people, they come from where I come from, I'm gonna tell these stories whether Hollywood wants to hear it or not, and took him time. It takes time to figure out where is the lane, where I should be, and how it should be done. And it does not happen overnight because it's not supposed to happen overnight. So I would say, first of all, for entrepreneurship, the fact that you have the heart of giving, you're always going to be given to. If that is coming from the right space, you will always have. You will never lack. And take care of yourself first because you cannot give what you don't have. So make sure that you are looking after yourself before you start looking after everybody else and wanting to give every, giving every giving every part of yourself away. And know that the 20s are about figuring it out. That's what they're here for, figuring it out. So you're going to have, oh, that worked, that didn't work, that didn't work. And about 28, 29, you, you're lucky if it's 28, 29. It starts, to, it starts to make some sense. I remember my 28th birthday, I woke up crying because up until that point, I'd been like a prodigy. The first black this and the first black that. And I go, I'm not going to be the first black anything anymore. But it was a growth period for me that really helped change the, 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 the rest of my career. Figuring it out. If you'd see my journals from the 20s, it was all like, I can't figure it out. What am I supposed to be doing? Am I supposed to be doing this reporter job? I hated it. I hated being a reporter. But my father was like, girl, you better not quit that job. They're paying you $25,000 a year. You're not going to get $25,000. So I felt because everybody else felt like I should have that job. So it's going to work out. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Hello, Dr. Winfrey. My name is Zachariah Smith. I'm a freshman business administration major with a concentration in uh, finance, double minor in sales and marketing from Chicago. Um, my question That's so much today, I don't even can't keep up with all that. Yeah. <laughs> my question for you today is how do you believe uh, we as the black community can make strides to level the educational barrier and repair ourselves mentally and financially mm. after the 300 years of enforced ignorance we've endured in this country? And what steps can I take as a man of Morehouse to help see this change through? Know who you are. I think the reason why we're lost as a people is because we've forgotten who we are. And you all are coming out of Morehouse. You are here to remind the people, the children, the generations behind you, your own generation of who we are. See, you, you, you can't get out in the street and act a fool. You can't be a misogynist. You can't, you can't use music or any other form of your artwork to degrade or to marginalize other people if you know who you are. <laughs> Cannot happen. <laughs> Cannot happen. So your job is to know and then to help others to know. That is it. All right, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Once you know, once you know what you owe, yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Winfrey. Uh, it's good to meet you. I'm Alexander. Um, I, last week, I just came back from the United Nations headquarters. I did a speech about sustainable goals. And yeah. Empowering Wasn't traffic leaders. terrible there? It was horrible. Oh, my goodness. Traffic oh, was my quite God. bad. Oh, yeah, it was um, bad. Yes. So, I was there. I was in town then. It was really? terrible. Yeah, yeah, traffic was quite crazy. Um, I was wondering, in terms of messaging, you talk about this growth period. Um, that people enter into. And I was wondering, how do you help engage, help young entrepreneurs gain stakeholder engagement values, how, the ability to engage the people that they're trying to affect with their social ventures and social businesses, and how are you going to be able to help them guide the way through those, you know, those hard times? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. No, I do not know the answer to that question. Gotcha. You have stumped me. No worries. Okay. All right, thank you for your Thank time. you. I do not know the answer to that. Are you going to sing? Okay. You were cut off? He was the first to be cut off. He he was the cut off. Oh, you were the cut off. <laughs> so, I think then we have okay, gotten okay, the okay. last question. That was that the last question? That that was the last question. He asked me the last question. I couldn't figure out the answer. Social ba da 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 da. I cannot answer that right now. I would have to give that some thought. I'm going to get your card or business or name or. Do you have a business already? I thought you did. <laughs> I thought you did. Uh, make, make sure you get this. Because you know what? This is one of those questions where I've been asking, answering a lot of questions, and I really want to give it some thought. Years ago, uh, the reason I have in my magazine a thing called What I Know For Sure and end up writing a book about what I know for sure. Years ago, I was on a TV show, and Gene Sisko um, asked me, uh, who was a famous uh, TV critic, asked me, what do you know for sure at the end of the interview? And I couldn't think of one darn thing I knew for sure. And so two days later, I call him up and I say, Gene, I now figured out what I know for sure. And he said, show's over, Oprah, I don't care. So <laughs> I, 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 will, I will actually think about that answer. Great. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I would like to say in closing that I have been made so proud coming here today. I, if you would pass the Andrew Young Center, you would see my portrait in red um, that will be here, you know, longer than I actual, actually will be alive. So that will go on. That will be a part of the legacy. Uh, seeing you young Oprah Winfrey scholars here today um, has moved me deeply. I am so proud of you. I'm proud of everybody in attendance at this school who is seeking to know more clearly who you are 
the value you hold and how you will share that value with the rest of the world. I was really surprised to learn that it's been 30 years since I made that $12 million donation to Morehouse. And so today, I would like to add $13 million to that. <laughs> so that we have a round figure of, I, I, I like things that even out, round numbers, solid numbers. I like a solid $25 million donation to Morehouse, so I am committing 13 more million more dollars to the Oprah Winfrey Scholarship Fund here at Morehouse. In the hopes in the hopes that it will continue, continue to help you fulfill, fulfill not just your dreams, not just your dreams, but the dreams of your families and families to come. Wow. God bless the hoes! <laughs> Oprah Winfrey.